Hello and welcome to WCET's second OER webcast, Consortia Success Stories, Institutions Working Together on OER Innovations. Thank you so much for joining us today. As we move through, please use the question box as any questions come up and we'll be sure to get to those at the end of the presentations. We are recording this presentation. We'll make the archive and the resources available next week as well as if you'd like to access the handouts from today, just click on the handout pane and you should be able to download those. And then if there are any uh, revisions, we'll be sure to send that out along with the link to the archive next week. Typically, we have a very active Twitter back channel. If you're interested in following, the hashtag is WCET Webcast. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the manager of events and programs here at WCET. If this is your first webcast with us, we're so pleased to have you today. Again, if you have any questions, go ahead and enter them into the chat box, or excuse me, the question box. The chat box is a great resource if you have anything to share or any comments. I can then feed that back to the rest of the audience. Today we're going to do a brief introduction of the Consortia Common Interest Group here at WCET, and then we'll dive into two multi-institutional strategies, Mary Burgess with BC Campus and Tanya Spillavoy with the North Dakota University System. We'll then get to the audience Q&A and the conclusion. Today I'd like to introduce our moderator, Kevin Corcoran. He's been the Executive Director of the Con Connecticut Distance Learning Consortium since 2011 and has served multiple roles within the consortium since 1999. The CTDLC serves two and four year public and private institutions throughout Connecticut and the region. Kevin has been an OER advocate in the region, co-founding the Northeast OER Consortium and was recently named co-chair of the Connecticut Legislative OER Tax Task Force. Please welcome Kevin. Thank you, Megan. And thank you for everybody attending. Um, I want to talk briefly about the WCET eLearning Consortia group who is sponsoring this event for today. Um, just ever so briefly, the eLearning e Consortium group, I believe, is the last standing common interest group for WCET. But the focus of the group is really to bring systems and consortia groups that are supporting member institutions around their eLearning initiatives. And this OER initiative or this OER collaboration fits perfectly. Um, this organization, or this group has been around for a little bit of time now, and it's been a great forum to share um, common successes and experiences with one another. And that's what we're here to hear from Mary and from Tanya today. As far as the group and what we have planned for the future, not only do we have the webinar today, but we have some additional webinars coming down the road. And we're also planning a pre-conference um, session at the 2016 annual meeting this year in Minneapolis. So with that said, uh, let's see, Megan, can you advance the slide? Thank you. Let me actually get into the introductions for today's event. Um, today we're going to be uh, sharing success stories on two collaborative OER programs, one that's a long-standing program in British Columbia and one that's a merging program in North Dakota. So first let me introduce uh, Mary Burgess, who's the Executive Director at BC Campus a system service organization providing support in teaching and learning, educational technology, and open education to British Columbia's post-secondary system. Prior to joining BC Campus in 2012, Mary was the director for Center in, uh, for Teaching and Educational Technologies at Royal Roads University, where she started the university's first open education resources project. She is a career instructional designer and a longtime advocate of OER. Joining Mary today for today's event is Tanya Spillavoy, the Director for Distance Learning, excuse me, Distance Education and State Authorization at the North Dakota University System. She is the regulator for post-secondary degree granting institution and serves as the state's SARA portal agent. Dr. Spillavoy also serves on the Midwestern Higher Education Compact SARA Steering Committee and the WCET Steering Committee with myself. She is currently leading a statewide open education resource initiative for the state of North Dakota. Tanya holds a Doctor of Higher Education Leadership and Organizational Change. She is passionate about leveraging technology to facilitate educational opportunities. And I'm thankful for both of them joining us today. 
Mary, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Kevin. Uh, I'm just going to advance to my first slide here, I think. Yay, it's working. Excellent. Well, I just want to start by saying welcome to everybody and thank you so much for attending. Uh, I'm, I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to talk about the work in British Columbia. Uh, and I also want to thank Megan and Russ and Kevin for inviting me. Uh, so I just want to let you know up front that throughout my presentation, I'm going to ask you some questions. And those are really just designed to help you reflect on your own context so as I'm talking about what we uh, have done in British Columbia I'm hoping you can kind of think about how that applies in your setting and how it might be different or the same uh, and and that's what what impact you might be able to have uh, within your own context with, within your own context <clears throat> excuse me so I'm just going to start with a brief what is BC campus so you kind of get an idea of the system that I'm working in uh, and so you can see here on this slide, I've got the logo of each of the 25 public post-secondary institutions that we have in British Columbia. And BC Campus is a system organization and we're funded by the government, specifically the Ministry of Advanced Education, to support these public post-secondary institutions, as Kevin said, in the areas of teaching and learning, educational technology and open education. And we do things like faculty professional learning, educational technology pilots and evaluation, curriculum development projects, uh, and of course open education and, and our big project on that front is the BC Open Textbook Project. And our role is really to sort of act as a provincial level teaching and learning center. Uh, and the teaching and learning centers within the institutions are really one of our primary uh, stakeholder groups. Um, we do also have some private institutions in British Columbia that we work with. So we'll just full disclosure on, on that piece. Um, they're, they're, uh, it's a slightly different system um, between public and private here as it is uh, everywhere. And so that relationship is slightly different, but they do factor into the work that we do here. And the institutions that we have in BC, uh, it, it's a, a really diverse system um, from the perspective that we kind of cover everything from your standard arts degrees, medicine, law, specialized applied, applied programs, trades. So as I say, it's, it's a pretty diverse system. But what I did want to point out is that while our system is really diverse, Compared to some of the systems in the U.S., we are very small in terms of numbers, just simply because there's way less people up here than there are down there, and so, uh, so it's a slightly different context from that perspective. <clears throat> Okay, so here's where we have our first question. And um, before I get started, I really just wanted to ask who is familiar with the five R's of open? And if you can use the voting buttons that Megan's going to pop up to indicate that. I really just wanted to get you thinking about this. It's going to be a quick refresher for some people. It'll be brand new to others. Um, but I just want to ensure that you're clear uh, on what we're talking about when, when we say open educational resources for this one. So I'll just give you a second to say, are you familiar with the five R's? Okay. Okay, that's great. And so as you can see on the slide, oh, so I just saw the poll. Oh, about 50-50. Okay, that's great, actually. So obviously, I don't want to spend a ton of time here, but I will say that the five R's are really important in terms of understanding open educational resources because what they do is help us understand what we can do when an open license is used versus uh, traditionally published materials. And so if you just look through that slide and and what those uh, what those five R's are you can kind of start to think about for example particularly as you get down into the lower R's the the right to make revisions uh, adaptations to content uh, the right to mix content with each other so taking two different um, pieces of content, maybe a set of quiz questions and a chapter out of an open textbook and putting those together into a remix, you can begin to see the power of the open license in terms of the flexibility that educators have uh, with respect to using the content and really having control over that content themselves. Uh, and so, uh, and it also will hopefully help you understand why we're doing this work because we just see the power 
power of openness as, uh, as opening so many more doors in terms of what educators can do with materials and indeed what students can do with materials as well um, because this applies obviously not only to the use of the materials by faculty, but also the use of materials by students too. So I would encourage you to look up uh, more about the five R's if you haven't already. You can see the source uh, down at the bottom there, that's Dr. David Wiley, uh, who is um, widely known in the open community and is really the person who kind of started this whole business and got us all into this craziness that we're, that we're doing and, uh, and is an incredibly inspirational figure for many of us. So let's move on to the next slide here, maybe. Okay, that's great. So just finally, uh, back to the open piece, that's really we're talking about free uh, with permissions that are enabling. And so that, and that is also uh, a perpetual access. And so we're not talking about materials that are digital that students only get access to for a semester or an academic year. This is a forever thing. So students get to keep these materials. Anybody gets to keep these materials and do with them what makes sense for them in their context. Okay, now let's actually get started on the content here. <clears throat> so again, I want to start with a poll question here. And the question is, have you ever collaborated with somebody from another institution? And, uh, and that's, a, again, it'll be a yes or no question. That's great. Getting everybody in there. Give you a minute to do that because we're going to talk quite a bit about collaboration between institutions in this presentation. Okay. Okay, that's great. So some of you have and seven you have. Some of you haven't and it's interesting to see that a larger proportion have, but that's a pretty good chunk of numbers who haven't. And so uh, so that's that's really interesting to, to sort of think about that. And, and I put this in the context of kind of the culture of sharing and collaboration and whether or not that culture exists. And, and I would encourage you to not just think about whether you've collaborated with somebody from another institution, but whether there is a culture of sharing within your institution. Uh, I'm just trying to go back a slide here because that's not where I need to be. There we go. Perfect. Uh, and so I, I want you to think about whether there's a culture of sharing within your institution, whether there's a culture of sharing within your discipline uh, or the system that you're part of and whether, whether you're part of a system that has a sharing that is sort of culturally embedded or whether it's sort of more of a lone, range, uh, lone ranger kind of culture uh, because that will really impact whether or not um, how easy it is to, to get collaboration and sharing happening. So I want to start by telling you about a program that we ran at BC Campus from 2003 to 2011 and that was called the Online Program Development Fund and it was administered by Paul Stacey uh, who's now with Creative Commons who many of you may know. Uh, he's quite active in, in the open education field and you can see here uh, the slide that I've got it really shows you uh, what institutions were involved and that's every institution in British Columbia was involved in this collaborative program at some point. The blue lines are, are how many, uh, the, the amount of funding that was received for an individual institution. Each time a, a, a proposal was submitted for this program, there had to be a lead institution. So you can kind of take a look and see some were, uh, some were more proactive in taking a leadership role, whereas some were more likely to kind of just partner with somebody else who was doing that. And so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that program. So it was actually created in 2003 to support development and sharing of online learning in British Columbia, which back in 2003 was kind of a big deal and pretty new. And in each year of the program, the government of British Columbia, through the Ministry of Advanced Education, gave us at BC Campus a grant that was to be used to fund institutions who were willing to create a variety of different digital learning resources. And those would include everything from small learning objects like a single concept, multi 
multimedia resource, all the way through to fully online courses and indeed actually fully online programs. And the key elements of the program that's really of interest to what we're talking about today was that when a grant was given, there was always a requirement for collaboration uh, with another institution in our system. And the resources also had to be openly licensed so that everybody in the system could use them. And as you can see here, what I was talking about with the lead institutions, the grant proposals always had to have a lead institution, as well as at least two other institutions as partners. And often, in many cases, there would also be uh, letters of support provided by still other institutions who didn't have maybe the capacity to be involved in the project, but were uh, interested in having whatever the end result of the project was. And, and the, what I want to say about this is that the, the real value of this, while we created uh, some great resources, it was really the value was the creation and stewardship of a culture of sharing between institutions. And was every project awesome? No, of course it wasn't. That never happens. But cumulatively, that expectation of collaboration and sharing really had a huge impact on our system. And so then we get to 2012. And after all those years of creating a variety of resources, our funder, the Ministry of Advanced Education, following advice from us at BC Campus and others in the system, made the decision to have that grant funding be more focused, and so the BC Open Textbook Project was born. I'm just going to take a drink. Okay, and so the BC Open Textbook Project is really uh, our ministry's response to a number of issues uh, within our system, including student debt and uh, lack of access to higher education uh, for some students due to economic issues. And uh, the project was first announced in 2012, actually at the Open Education Conference in Vancouver by the minister then, whose name was John Yap. And what he announced was that the ministry would provide a million dollars to BC Campus to manage for the creation of 40 open textbooks. And that first uh, set was for the most highly enrolled first and secondary uh, subjects in BC institutions. And then a year later, they gave us uh, another million dollars to work on 20 more textbooks that were for skills and training, so trades, tourism, technology, healthcare, those kinds of areas. And those were really aligned with areas uh, in our province in which we had a, a skills gap. Uh, and you can see now uh, we have also been working with both Alberta and Saskatchewan as of a couple of years ago on this project and Manitoba now as well. Uh, and so uh, as with the online program development fund, we wanted this funding to have reach because a million dollars sounds like a lot, but it's really not when you're looking at a system of funding. And so we use the same kinds of stipulations with our call for proposals to ensure that that collaboration would happen. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Uh, so, so we now have a poll here that I'm going to ask you about. And uh, in BC, we have something called articulation committees. And, and I think most of you will be familiar with them as discipline panels. And I'm wondering if anybody has been part of a discipline panel. So that's the question. Have you been part of a discipline panel? Or an art articulation committee, if you're from uh, British Columbia or elsewhere? Or something like that. Just give you a minute to think about that. All right. No, lots of you know. Okay, so this is a, and a few of you, yes, so just a few of you will know what I'm talking about. And in BC, we do call them articulation committees because one of the functions is to ensure that students can move between institutions in our province and transfer as much credit as possible. And the great thing about these committees is that they're made up of a bunch of people who all teach the same subject but in different institutions and they're used to working together. So I'm just going to bump us to the next slide here, back to the... Hey, Megan, oh, there we go. <laughs> Can I get you to take us to the articulation committee slide? 
or I'm my bad. There we go. We're okay. We're good. Uh, and so because these people are used to working with each other and they all teach in the same subject area, we saw this as one of our first opportunities to really reach out to faculty in a way that would enable us to gauge their interest uh, from a particular discipline, working across an entire system. And because we were working on books in particular subject areas, we targeted those articulation committees uh, in particular uh, and used that opportunity to find out about the interest. And we also used it to find out whether that particular group was particularly risk averse or whether they were willing to try new things, how much interest there was in say teaching and learning versus research within the discipline. And that all really helped us inform our strategies for engagement going forward. And we were also able to plant the seed of collaboration with these people so we could address them as a group and say, you guys are the provincial subject matter experts on this and we need you and we'll support you and you can do it with each other. And, and actually one of, the, one of the great things that came out of this for us was that we uh, were able to create a, a BC specific geography textbook um, by working with the articulation committee for BC geography uh, faculty. And so that, that's the way that, that we sort of function within those groups and, and it was pretty successful for us. So the next one is that within our calls for proposals, and you're seeing on your screen just a chunk of one of our uh, uh, one of our calls for proposals for the creation of new textbooks, and you can see the piece I've highlighted there. And uh, I would just want you to note also that we allowed people to collaborate both within their own institution as well as within other institutions, uh, as well as with other institutions. And we did that because we have all worked in institutions and so we're fully aware of the silos that develop there, uh, even within a department. And we really wanted to encourage breaking those silos down. Uh, and we also wanted to encourage faculty collaborate not just with each other, but also with teaching and learning centers and libraries. Uh, and so um, it has really evolved. Uh, and there's been some strategic pushing around this from us. So for example, we might hear from two separate people within an institution who are both wanting to do something very similar but don't know about each other. So one of our roles has been to really connect people both within institutions and between institutions. Uh, and so, um, so now I have a poll question for you here and that is would you say you collaborate more with colleagues at your own institution or at other institutions? And that's been a really interesting piece for us to watch how that's evolved. All right. Okay, what do we got there? Okay, so mostly within your own institution. And that's really interesting because here in BC, it actually tended to be more outside the institution. So faculty particularly were collaborating uh, with people outside of their institution who were within their discipline, right? Uh, but it interestingly has really opened up a discussion within our institutions, within departments, uh, to have those conversations with each other, with the Teaching and Learning Center. So for example, we now have OER working groups being set up within institutions that cover a variety of roles within the institution that that really wasn't the case before um, and so now we have uh, departments getting together to decide on textbooks for example and open textbooks are now part of that conversation uh, in part because of that work that we were doing so I'm just gonna bump us to the next slide here for another piece Maybe. There we go. Uh, and so, uh, as I said earlier, in British Columbia, we have a pretty diverse system, and it's made up of big research institutions like the 
the University of British Columbia you may have heard of, teaching universities, colleges, and institutes. And to represent those, we have groups called sector councils, uh, and those bring the senior leadership of those institution types together to collaborate on a variety of issues from both the academic and business related sides of the institutions. And they're primarily the membership is presidents, VPs academic, VP finance, etc. And again, those groups are accustomed to collaborating with each other, uh, and they see the purpose of their group in part as advancing both the goals of their own institutions, but also of the system that they're part of. And so very early on in our project, I went to each of these three groups, the Research Universities Council, BC Association of Institutes and Universities, and the BC Colleges group, and asked for their support in promoting the involvement of their faculty and staff in our project. And we had a lot of support from these groups and continue to have support. And that's been highly impactful for us. And you know, I mean, while we all like to view ourselves as independent and, and while there's sometimes acrimony between faculty and administrators, our experience with this project has really been that when a VP academic sends a note to all faculty encouraging them to get involved in a project, it has an immediate impact on the level of interest and we start getting calls. Uh, and so presenting it in front of these groups rather than on an individual basis at each of the institutions not only saved us time and effort, it also to some degree had the effect of creating some competition between them. So some who wants to be the first to say that they got involved or that they have the largest number of adoptions or, or that kind of stuff. So, so that was really uh, impactful for us. Okay, now, how many librarians in the crowd today? So this is my final question, and I think I, it sounds like there's lots of you. So let's do sort of a raise your hand if you're a librarian or, or the poll. Uh, who is a librarian in the crowd today? I think Megan's just pulling that up. <laughs> if not, wave your arms around. <laughs> <laughs> this is Megan. I'm just going to jump in and invite all of the attendees to just put a note into the chat box and let us know if they're a librarian or not. Awesome. Simple. That's YouTube. great. Thanks, Megan. Thank you. And the reason I'm asking about this is because, holy cow, talk about a group that mobilizes really quickly and has a big impact. So in British Columbia, uh, we have a group called the BC OER Librarians. And, uh, and the way this came about was that we were about to enter the second year of our project and we'd been talking a lot all the way through the project about how to involve librarians. And we knew the work of Quill West, who some of you may know. Um, and uh, oh, that's nice. Virus. Don't don't worry about the virus notification up there. Uh, and so we knew we had a lot of librarians in our system who really wanted to advocate for OER, but didn't necessarily kind of have the language or a firm enough grasp on the concepts to feel confident doing that. And we knew there was a strong library community amongst the, the post-secondary institutions. And we'd gone and talked with the uh, BC Consortium of Post-Secondary Library Directors. Again, this is another system level group that gets people together from the institutions. And they were really supportive, but not really in a position to take a lot of action as a group. Uh, and we also knew we didn't have a lot of resources to devote to this piece. So we started tapping people on the shoulder, librarians who we knew in the system, to see who would step up. And it turns out we got an amazing group of very dedicated individuals who have really hit the ground running. And they've done Hackfest to create materials. You're seeing pictures here of those groups working together to create materials that they were able to share with each other. Uh, and, uh, and they've held learning events both for other librarians and for faculty. And they've shared their resources both with each other and with many other groups outside the jurisdiction. 
And so that's been incredibly successful and we're just really grateful to, to that group for, for all the work that they've done. And our next focus for this kind of group is a provincial level instructional designer OER group and we're just in the process of putting that together now. And we see this group as really crucial as we move toward advancing not just the affordability and access questions that we do with open but also raising the bar when it comes to using open educational resources to enhance pedagogy and and improve learning success for students these instructional designers are really the people who work directly with faculty on curriculum so they can have a huge influence what we don't want is for every institution to create their own resources in a vacuum <clears throat> And okay, so you can see the, the impact that, that we've had up here. Again, keeping in mind that we have a very small system, but we went from zero textbooks in our uh, collection to now it's actually, st this is old, it, we have 140 open textbooks, and we've impacted about 11,541 students in our system, and you can see our student savings numbers there at the bottom as well. Uh, this just um, makes me feel so proud of our system because it's really a, a collaboration. Uh, and, and we are at, at, at BC Campus really working toward making this a system-owned project uh, rather than a centralized project that, that BC Campus campus owns and uh, and so we're now in a in a position of building capacity out to our institutions we are trying to move away as I keep telling people from hand holding to hand off and really enabling uh, institutions to support each other uh, with with help from us uh, and, and using our system as a channel to do that and so that's really what we're doing and so I would encourage you to take a look at our collection when you have a moment to do so. Uh, it's pretty easy to find one of the things that we often heard was how difficult it was to find. So we've put a lot of attention into creating a, a website that makes it easy for people to search and find our, our textbooks. And so I encourage you to go there and use the resources and, and be involved. Thank you very much. Mary, thank you so much. How impressive, not only the amount of materials that you've produced, but maybe even the bigger challenge was actually getting so much collaboration um, integrated into your culture. I just, kudos to that. So thank just you a so quick, much. Just a quick reminder, we're going to pull all the questions towards the end and um, we'll try to answer as many as we can, but I, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Tanya Spillavoy to talk about what is going on in North Dakota. Hi everybody, thank you so much for all being here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. Okay, so um, this is me, uh, North Dakota's Open Textbook Fairy, and I'm um, very excited to be here with you today. Uh, that's kind of a silly picture that we all dressed up for Halloween, but it probably does capture the spirit of the project and who I am um, and how I approach things here. So again, um, just to reiterate what OPEN is, we use the Hewlett Foundation uh, definition and it really reflects exactly what she had just been saying about the concept of OPEN and the whole spirit of um, being able to use uh, full courses, course materials, textbooks, streaming videos and texts and that other people are able to repurpose and use um, the, the knowledge that we produce. So you're probably wondering, what is the North Dakota Open Educational Resources Initiative? It was first started with a legislative funding and interest in 2013, and it's led by the North Dakota University System Office. Um, there's a collaboration with the Open Textbook Network and Open Textbook Library at the University of Minnesota. And there's also, um, we did a system-wide Open Educational Resources Summit uh, there's a data-driven system-wide faculty survey, which was a um, collaboration with Babson Research Group, and I'll show you more about that later. And also, we're doing campus-funded initiatives, so 
uh, campuses around the state are able to apply for uh, funding to do their own open resources and open textbook projects. And the goal of this whole initiative is to reduce student textbook costs. So this is kind of a review of how the system in North Dakota works. Um, it's important to talk about where funding comes from, who has governance, and how policy is influenced. So um, if you look at the giant wheel, that's the North Dakota University system, and it's made up of community colleges, four-year institutions, and research institutions. Um, none of us have, when I say none of us, I mean nobody really has um, the authority to tell uh, the institutions what to do or where to go with their projects. So. Um, while the legislature can influence with funding or with, um, you know, uh, asking us to do or look at different things, uh, they're not able to just force faculty to carte blanche um, uh, adopt all open textbooks. Say, um, they have to. Do, we have to do it in different ways. And when you're talking about working together as a system, it really takes more. Um, collaboration, working with folks, and leading in a completely different way. So you see the North Dakota State Board of Higher Education and the university system wheel. We intersect with the legislature as a coordinating body, and we um, coordinate a lot of initiatives with the university system um, institutions. Of course, you have accreditors and the federal government who enforces Title IV and Title IX and all kinds of other things. So. Um, the institutions themselves really have a lot of different influencers and I think the thing that is most important to talk about in this presentation is that faculty are the keepers of the curriculum and so we really respect the ability for our faculty to choose their own resources, um, own what happens in the classroom and make decisions about what is the best way to reach learning objectives. And so um, the project itself wasn't something that was um, uh, mandated from above. So what we did instead was create opportunities for collaboration. Uh, we joined the Open Textbook Library. This is at the University of Minnesota. You can go here and check out the Center for Open Education and the Open, Education, the Open Textbook Network. It's a fantastic collection and this is a library of all the open textbooks that meet their criteria. It also has a fantastic um, peer review process where uh, professors from different um, genres can go in and, and rate the books. Um, why You might wonder why we did this, and this is a great example. Um, this is my best friend from college. When she was a sophomore in college, she um, got pregnant and had to leave school. Uh, she never finished her degree, and now that she's a mother of two, she's trying to go back and finish her bachelor's degree. And I asked her if I could use this, and she said yes, and this was her um, post on Facebook. Um, $500 for textbooks is very oppressive for someone like Kim. She works at a daycare. Uh, she's trying to take care of two boys. And um, the crunch of a textbook cost is really oppressive, especially when her um, student loans uh, payment wouldn't come in until after she needed the textbooks. One of the things we found, uh, and this is from the Florida Student Textbook Survey, is that uh, students were asked if the cost of a textbook had ever caused them to not purchase the required textbooks, take fewer courses, or not register for a specific course, earn a poor grade, drop a course, or fail a course. And these, these percentages are just really disheartening. This isn't something we ever want our students to do is not purchase the textbook because it's too expensive. We know that if students don't have their materials within the first three weeks, that they just don't do that well in the course. And these numbers um, show that. So cost really does matter when it comes to student achievement. Um, in a peer-reviewed study, now this was done with um, 11 different peer-reviewed studies, they found that students who used open resources um, did as well as students who um, were learning from a traditional textbook. And this will be in my notes too, so you can access the different um, studies that this came from. 
So you're probably wondering how in North Dakota we gained the um, trust and collaboration from the faculty. And I knew right away that there were a lot of faculty who were already doing this in their courses. Um, they just maybe weren't talking about it. I think we have some really innovative people out there who are doing cool things. Um, and maybe they're just so focused on their students and their courses that nobody really knew what was happening in the classroom. So I went to the um, Council of College Faculties and did a presentation about open resources and asked for their help. And this is a group of um, faculty that are nominated from their institutions to serve in a, in a council across the whole state. And um, with a lot of help from that group, the uh, faculty across the system created a statement that affirmed that they understand um, that there are things that will be changing, that there will probably be more need for open textbooks, and that the rising cost of textbooks is difficult for students. They also asserted their own um, ownership over the curriculum and wanted to make sure that they under that everybody understood that faculty have the discretion to choose the best course materials and that's really important because um, faculty um, let's say some some disciplines may just not have materials that would best fit um, from the open textbook library or from an OER um, some faculty have to have a textbook and so um, we just want faculty to use the best resource for their course and if it happens to be an open textbook or an OER or if it's um, a, a textbook that they feel like students need to purchase then that's their that's their purview but there is a huge support from the faculty and this is this is catching on faster than um, I ever imagined it would across the state so I wanted to have a baseline report and find out exactly where the faculty were with their adoption of open resources. Babson produced a preliminary national report in 2014. And in 2015, I um, worked with uh, Jeff Seaman there to do a statewide assessment of where our faculty were. And so you can access the online learning surveys at the Babson Survey Group website and see you and read them for yourself, but I'll give you the highlights. So what we found was that North Dakota University System faculty are actually more aware of open educational resources than their counterparts nationally, and I really do believe that's due in part to um, the focus that we've had here at the system office and also messaging from the, um, the legislature. Uh, similar to their peers nationally, NDUS faculty are taking the initiative with OER adoption. We found that there were um, barriers to adoption, but there's a lot of people actually using open educational resources across the state and across the nation. Um, one of the things that folks weren't sure of is that they weren't sure if they could sufficiently judge the quality of an open educational resource. And that's one of the reasons why joining the Open Textbook Library at the University of Minnesota was so helpful because there's a rigorous peer review process. So faculty who weren't sure if they wanted to adopt an open textbook could look through the reviews of other faculty in their um, discipline area to see if they felt like this was a quality product. Um, we also found that it does take time and effort to find and evaluate open resources and open textbooks and so we wanted to take away some of those barriers and I'll talk about how we did that with funding. Um, one of the things that I'm very proud about is that faculty in North Dakota enjoy significant amount of autonomy in the selection of course materials and at every level so um, even at the two years associates level our faculty are able to choose their resources for their courses this is exciting because there's a lot of resources that are open and free to use at the two-year and four-year level um, it gets more difficult up into the graduate and um, professional courses, but um, it's exciting that our faculty have the ability to choose the, the materials that they would like. Um, and I was happy to see that a majority of our system faculty say that they will or might use open resources in the next three years. So we'll see what all of this results um, at the end of our project 
we'll do this survey again to see how much um, people have changed. So let's see. Um, where could you find some open resources? My, my best um, advice would be to check out the University of Minnesota Open Textbook Library, and you can check out BC Campus as well. Librarians are rock stars when it comes to open educational resources and open textbooks. They understand copyright laws. They understand the concept of Creative Commons and open. So talk to your librarian. I would also tap into instructional designers. They can help you do... Um, the modifications or adapt or um, adopt them into your courses. Uh, you can check out Merlot, which is online, Rice OpenStax, uh, Khan Academy has some great videos. You can look at YouTube videos as well. Um, all of the TEDx videos are openly licensed and just really any openly licensed learning object. So now you're probably wondering how can you do this in your state or with your people? And this is my best advice to you. Uh, listen to what people want and then tell them what's in it for them. So if I were trying to sell a car and you're interested in performance, I wouldn't spend my whole time focused on the sleek lines and the snazzy colors. I would talk about performance. So you have to think about what people want to know about your project. Um, in my state, legislators want to do something that's good for their constituents in their state. They're interested in safeguarding state funds. They want to know about a return on investment. They're interested in re-election and they want accountability from the people who get state funding. I have to make sure that I show that to them. Faculty want control over the curriculum. They want good learning out outcomes. They want autonomy to teach their courses and they want to make sure their students are learning. When I talk to faculty, that's what I focus on. Um, students they're concerned with their cash, so they want to save money, they want accessibility, technology, they want an easy learning experience. When I talk to students, I, I tailor my presentation to those things. Um, and when I talk to administrators, they're really interested in the bottom line. They say, how much time is this going to take my people? Um, how much is this going to cost me? What's the return on investment? Will I be able to retain more students? Will I be able to attract more students? And all of those things are very important for a president or a provost or someone who's in an administrative position. And so while all of these um, areas are important, different groups of people want to know different things about your project. So really focus on that when you talk to different groups. Um, number two, don't try to change anyone's religion. So I use that as an example. Have you? If anybody comes up to you and tries to change your religion, do you actually change it? Usually no. Um, when I talk to someone and they don't want to do open resources, I say thank you for your time and um, work with someone else. I, I don't spend a lot of time arguing about it because I feel like it's a waste of my time and it just makes people not really want to um, be part of it. So my... Um, my best advice is this little picture over in the corner where you see the people dancing around the fire. Uh, I like to work with people who like to work with me. So everywhere you go, there will be folks who are excited to do what you're doing and they love to join in on the party. And what we do is we start a little spark and we start dancing around it and then more people are attracted and the fire gets bigger. And then as you continue with your project and people see how much fun you're having and what a great outcome you're having and they just start wanting to join in, it really is my best way to lead any kind of project like this. Um, I, I, I don't want to force people to do anything they don't want to do. I'd rather just really focus on the people who are excited about it. And everywhere I go, there's people who are excited about this project. Um, make a plan, stick with it. You can adjust along the way, but just don't give up. Repeat the message as you go. Um, and number five, this was probably one of my best advices, but there are people out there who you need to get permission from um, to get this work done. And you gotta know who do you go to to get the signature. So somewhere along the way, there's a person who has to sign off on your project, um, get that signature, and you need to know who has the authority to um, let you go to the next step in your project. And finally, just don't quit. Keep, keep it up. Okay, I'm done. Now I guess we can go to questions. 
Tanya, thank you so much. That's a great presentation. I, I absolutely love the idea that you adapted the, the Babson survey to do, get a baseline for North Dakota. I may have to copy you. Please do. It's, it's an open resource, so I can give you all the contact information, and others can do it too. Fantastic. So um, this is the time to use the questions box. I'm going to just take a quick, uh, quick peek and see what we have in here for questions. So we have a, a good question here. Um, what's the long-term effect on educational publishers? Can they morph to a lower cost model, or will we lose resource alternatives in the future? And that was uh, Joe Lane. Mary or Tanya, do you want to take that? This is Tanya. I can talk to that a little bit. Um, and then, Mary, if you want to add stuff to it as well. But I really don't. Yes. S I think that publishers are trying to do things that um, are more modernizing or, or fitting in with this. And then there's other publishers who are trying a lot harder to clamp down and make it more difficult for their uh, materials to be adapted and adopted. So, um, you know, they might have like a one-time use access code for an online resource and once that's gone, the book is useless and the student can't resell it. And so we're seeing, you know, different strategies where either um, publishers are making it more difficult to share and reuse and others that are trying to make it more open. What do you think? Yeah, I, I would agree with that, and 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 I would also say I I think um, that there's also uh, I I've, I've seen cases of for example publishers offering to lower the price on a given textbook with an individual faculty member because they know that that faculty member is considering open, and so I think I mean I think we need to consider the fact that really the whole publishing industry is in flux right now and. And, and open is just one of the pressures they're experiencing. And so I, I think there's, they're sort of trying to sort that out within the context of the pressures that they have. And so I don't think it necessarily means that there will be fewer alternatives. I, I actually think there will be better alternatives, both for faculty and for students. Maybe as a follow-up, do you see a next generation of publishers? You know, with Lumen Learning, for example, there's a very low-cost buy-in, and that money goes towards sustainability, and we see other OER providers following that model. What do you think about a, a next generation of publishers? I think this is yeah, I think it's, it's going to have to change. I mean, um, I remember when I was in high school, there were three bookstores in my city, and now there's one. And so as we've, you know, progressed, everybody has had to change their business model. I think that that will be the same thing for textbook companies as well. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I think, as I said, things are in flux and there's some changes. And we've got, you know, a, a new demand from consumers creating a change, right? And so as with every consumer oriented business the providers have got to find a way to to match up with what consumers want and and textbook publishers are obviously struggling with that right now but many of them are finding ways to be successful and and in some cases it's around providing not necessarily content but services or ancillary resources like homework systems uh, and so I, I think there there are some changes happening there that are really positive I think it's really important also to note that open does not equal um, online. So open doesn't have to be on your screen. A lot of these resources that I've talked about at the Open Textbook Library or um, at Rice OpenStax, and I'm not sure about BC Campus, but they're available in an actual hardcover book or a, some kind of a, yeah. a way you can bind it. So. Um, it's important to remember that books in general aren't going away, that um, people love books. I still love books. I was an English major. So it's not, it's not the concept of is it a piece of paper or prints or is it online, but more is it affordable, is it open, is it, you know, the four R's. So um, that's really the crux of the issue and not so much books versus uh, a screen. So, so related to this question um, around sort of alternatives, it comes. There's another question that's about the concerns that there may be around the variety and the quality of OER. 
And do you have any thoughts or uh, response to the audience about sort of the, the current variety and quality of OER available? I mean, I think what's happening is there are just more and more content is being created. And so uh, three years ago when we started their pro our project, there wasn't very much. There is an unbelievable amount of content available now. Uh, and so I think that problem is going away quite quickly, actually, now as people begin to share. And people are coming out of the woodwork who were sharing in the past but didn't kind of have a name for it. So so I think there's that. I also, the, the quality question is really interesting and, and actually comes up less and less now. As Tanya was mentioning, uh, on the Open Textbook Network uh, as well as on BC Campus, we have a pretty strict uh, review criteria that every book can be put through. And so we post, as does the Open Textbook Network, uh, the reviews that faculty have done of our textbooks along with the textbooks so that when somebody comes along to have a look at whether or not they would want to adopt or adapt it, they can see exactly what other faculty think of that resource. And so I actually think it's an incredibly powerful way of determining quality that we don't actually have uh, the affordances of with traditionally published textbooks. We're making an assumption that those are high quality. They may or may not be because we don't have that same data from people who are actually teaching in the subject area as we are as we are with open now I think because of this question of quality which I think in some cases stems from that if it's free how could it possibly be good conversation open has had to be higher quality more rigorous because of that question that keeps coming up and so I, I think that's largely a red herring at this point in in the context of openness I'd have to agree with you I think this is a very similar conversation to maybe what we experienced five years ago with um, is an on, could an online course possibly be as good a quality as a face-to-face -face course and and so we had all of those discussions you know in the recent years and now we know that students are doing well in all kinds of modalities and so um, this is just another you know question that we'll we'll be fine with as we move forward. Well, and I think the great piece that you both brought up is because it's openly licensed and it's perpetual that way, if you don't like it, change it. So uh, one other question w was related to, you know, potential pushback you might get either from administration or bookstores because th there's the, the concern about lost revenues from textbook sales. H how would you address those concerns? Um, this is Tanya. I have I have had that question, and um, you know, I mean, it's never it's never my interest in um, you know stopping a bookstore from uh, functioning. But but the the project really isn't about making money from the sale of textbooks. The project is about saving money for students. And so I just have to reiterate that the that the point of the project is to reduce the cost of textbooks for students and that bookstores will find other ways to bring in revenue for the campus. I don't know, it's, it's a difficult question, yeah. but it's, it's not, it isn't the focus of my project, I guess. No, and we've also had, Mary, we've had a lot of those conversations as well. And I mean, I think the reality is for bookstores, open is kind of only one of the vast pressures that they have now. Uh, Amazon has really put a lot of pressure on bricks and mortar uh, bookstores and, and other online retailers. And so that, uh, that service at an institution as a revenue line was in decline anyway. And so the bookstores were already having to kind of look at how do we, how do we fund our, our business model. The other thing I would say though is, and, and this is where I get a little bit on my soapbox, so forgive me. I think the fact that students are not able to participate in higher education because the cost of books is too high 
when they go to the bookstore is a problem and it shouldn't be up to students to resolve that problem by continuing to have to pay those prices. And so I think institutions, including the bookstores, are going to have to look at other ways of doing that. And one of them in our case is that print-on-demand service because they can recoup their costs on doing that and, and charge students a nominal amount for that. And so again, I just, I, I think we got to look always at this is so that students can learn. This is so that more people can have access to higher education and the system has to evolve. The institutions have to evolve in order to enable that to happen. Now I'll so get off my soapbox. <laughs> so we're coming clo close to the end so I want to pick two more questions and then anybody else that's asked a question we'll try to figure out some way of replying specific to you. But one of the questions, and, and this was actually one of the ones I had for Mary, with 139 new developed um, textbooks, actually the question's for both of you. Do, do you find that your faculty are leaning more towards creating new or are they looking to adopt, adapt? What, what has your, been your experience and, and why? So in our case, it's been, uh, and actually the numbers bear this out across uh, OER projects, the most common thing to do is just to adopt an existing open textbook. That said, I think there are, uh, there are certainly cases where we're in the room and it's not something that's in the top 40 highly enrolled. It's not something that is from the jobs plan. Maybe it's a grad program or something like that. And so in those cases, obviously, people are really interested in doing uh, creations of their own. But, but I do think, as I say, the, the, what the research shows is that people mostly just adopt. I'd agree. Megan, I don't know if we have time for one more or, or do we need to wrap it up? Uh, let's go ahead and wrap it up. I think there's a few open questions that I'll pull out and share with the presenters. They can provide written responses and we'll get those back out along with the link to the recording. Thank you so much, Kevin. You did a wonderful job moderating. Thank you, Tanya, and thank you so much, Mary. I think this was a wonderful presentation. Thank you for inspiring us all to do what we can to improve access and affordability. Mark, March 17th, which is St. Patrick's Day here in the United States, for Learning to Adapt 2.0, the state of adaptive learning in higher education today. And we'll be sending out more about how to register for this webcast. But do save the date. We're looking forward to a, a webcast led by our adaptive learning fellow, Nikki Bray. Learn more and stay connected. Visit the new WCET website so you can stay abreast of all the upcoming events and programs including our Leadership Summit on 21st Century Credentials in Salt Lake City, June 8th through 9th. Again, we'll be sending all the resources out to those that registered, and you can also visit the WCET webcast page for prior webcasts, including last week's OER webcast, uh, Managing and Finding OER. Thank you to WCET supporting members and our sponsors who underwrite much of our work. So thank you to all that support our ongoing work. Again, thank you to our presenters. Enjoy your day. <laughs>